you know it's not what you're taught? It's what you caught that, that you hold with you. You see, a lot of people hear the word. And if you'll remember the time during Paul on the road to Damascus, it says his disciples traveled with him. And it says a bright shining light shone on Paul and he fell off his high horse. There's quite a lot of little preaching in that. Paul was persecuting the church and even having them killed. Christians killed in the name of Judaism. And so Paul's heart was pure because he thought he was doing the will of God. I, I don't know how you would think that was the will of God. So he's riding with his disciples on the road to Damascus to go persecute some more. And God shows up, knocks him off his high horse, falls to the ground. But what I'm trying to tell you is everybody there heard something, but they couldn't tell what was spoken to Paul. Which is another testimony that Satan can't pick up what you hear in the spirit. He's been locked out of the spirit realm. Now, he's spiritual, but he's been stripped of only one thing, the ability to con you out of telling him what you're going to be doing so he could hinder you. Someone say, oh, me. All right, so we want to get past that. So Paul on the road to Damascus, he was blind for three days, but nobody really understood what God said to him personally. Listen, God wants to be your personal savior. He doesn't want you to join a church. We don't really have any membership here. And God did that on purpose. He said, I just want you to preach the word and I'll send the right people to you. And I says, Lord, are you sure? He says, yeah, you did it the other way. And it was good. It was a success. But it, you, you wiped yourself out, didn't you? Yes, I did. And God said, in these last days, you're not going to promote any humanness of yourself. You're not going to advertise. It's all going to be word of mouth. So if you get blessed from the teachings and all that, go share somebody. Bring somebody to the church. It's all good because it's all God. Isn't Pastor Kerry charming you? I know I'm a, a pretty charming guy, Dave. <laughs> you know, and it isn't our personalities. Sometimes churches are built on, on music. They're built on different things. But we want to build this one on the rock. We want you to center your life around Jesus Every day, every day, die out to yourself so that yourself doesn't rise up and become a monster like mine did. My selfishness can really become not so pretty. And so you have a, a flesh part of you that God says is not going with you. Can you say amen? He says he's going to change it in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. This corruption will put on incorruption. And it says death will be for a Christian swallowed up in victory. So for a Christian, you might die physically, but you won't die spiritually because you have Jesus in where? In our heart. Look at your neighbor and say, I have Jesus in my heart. He lives big. You see, here's another thing. The more you confess Jesus being in your heart, the bigger he swells in your heart. That's why the enemy keeps us to try to, don't mention Jesus now, we're with our relatives. You know, tries to suppress everything. But the more we speak the Lord and talk about him as our friend and our loved one, which he is, the more God develops inside of us. Because how did we get saved, folks? You believed in your heart, right? And then you confessed with your mouth. With, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So if every day you confess the Lord, your salvation is working more and more and more. Grace and peace are multiplied through you through the knowledge of him. And you're growing up into the head, which is Jesus Christ of the whole body of Christ. Can you say amen? Let's look at our scripture. This is our beginning scripture for the day or for the week. Okay, this is Matthew 4, 24 and 25. It says, then his fame went throughout all Syria. Jesus was preaching. Multitudes were getting saved. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, to Gia, and beyond Jordan. Amen? So, I think we need to realize that the fame of Jesus was so great, but why? 
Why was Jesus so great? Didn't the Jews reject him? Didn't people reject him? But the Father sent him because he was the Word made flesh. Amen. And he dwelt among us so we could behold his glory. The only glory of the Father. So, there's three. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is the active member that we focus on so he could reveal the Father to us. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, he's not the Father God. Here's something you might not know. When you read your Bible in the Old Testament, where you see God operating in the earth, that's Jesus before he became the Messiah. The Father has never got off his throne. Can you tell me why? The Father's never got off his throne because he, if he got off his throne, he stopped ruling and reigning. He stopped being in charge. So the active part of the Trinity or Godhead is Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? When Abraham saw the angels of the Lord, remember they were going to come tell Abraham, we're going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And they stopped off at Abraham's tent. And Abraham gave them water and fed them, you know. And it says the angel of the Lord. And so the two angels went, but the angel of the Lord stayed with Abraham. Who do you think the angel of the Lord was? Jesus Christ. Before he became the Messiah. He was the word that was going to be made flesh but in the Old Testament he was the active part of the representative of the Father that worked through the Old Covenant. Say amen. Alright see that's a whole lot of information I really didn't need to know. <laughs> amen. Alright so I want to just let you know let's read my paragraph to you alright it's really really good. Good to see you brother. Alright this is the ability to hear and to do the word of God creates the results that the word has promised. Do you believe that? This gives us confidence knowing that the Lord is working with us and in us, in us backing his word. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was. So in the beginning was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father sent His Word to deliver us. That was Psalms 107 verse 20. So when He sent His Word to deliver us, the Word became flesh, was born of a virgin, and dwelt among us. The miracle birth. You see, mankind fell in Adam, so all of us are polluted. That's why we do things wrong. But only one man came, sent by God, where he didn't have the corrupted blood nor the corrupted flesh that you and I have. His name was Jesus. And so the Father says, my word will become flesh. He will dwell among you so that you can give an account of him. For he will testify of me. And Jesus often said, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That would you see me do, that do I, because the Father has revealed it to me. May us, may you and I be just like that. God, show us what you want us to do. That's why we meet with God. So he unveils certain things. Now, we, we have habits. We have certain scheduling that we do. But we want to always make room for God. Say amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. <laughs> All right. So as we begin to follow the word of God, it's the doer of the word that's blessed and not the hearer only. We actually deceive ourselves when we think we can follow God in our own strength. We're going to read that scripture. Well, what do we do, Pastor Kerry? Well, we surrender to God daily. We ask him who lives in us to take over our direction for the day. We lay our body at the altar because the Bible says our body becomes a living sacrifice. So you imagine you're taking your body off like a jacket and throwing it down while you're meeting with God and God is operating on it so it won't resist you and get in your way throughout the day. Boy, I'm a poet, huh? So if without the meeting with God, you're still going to carry some flesh with you. You're still going to have a mind that's always going to want to figure things out. Look at your neighbor and say, have you figured it out yet? I mean, know that I used to always say this. If we get God into our figure, now he'll be too small to help you with your problems. You can't figure God out. He's too big. God is beyond space, time, 
in any past, present, and future. He's beyond all of that. So if you're thinking that the devil is all that, you forgot how God is beyond all of that. All he has to, you see the enemy, God, no, I have to really be careful what I say. God, once he sets something in motion, he doesn't stop it. So if he sets mankind in motion to repopulate the earth, to, to prosper, for us to be in health and all these things, he's not going to stop that flow. He set us out on a journey. Can you say amen? Sail on. When the water gets high, sail on. Anyway, so he sent us on a journey. He can't then stop us once he set it in motion. That's why God has to allow Satan to choke himself. Because God can't annihilate him or cause him to cease to exist. He's an eternal being. So he has to imprison him. But he's got to have enough evidence on him to imprison him for eternity. How many know that God has already sentenced Satan to hell? He's already sentenced. He's already going. The thing that Satan is doing right now is trying to take as many of God's children with him as he can. Hell was never made for people. Never made for you and I. Because there are an outlaw on this planet that ruins people's lives. And if we don't get with God, see, we get religion, but we don't get with God. We become religious. No. Get with God. He has the plan for you and your family. Amen. He's got the blueprint. Now you could be reading your Bible and it's wonderful and I encourage that. But it won't really make a whole lot of sense till you get with God so he can help show you the keys of it. It's written in such a fashion that Satan can't understand it. Why? He can read the Bible. No. If the princes of this world, the scripture said, had known what Jesus came to do, they would have never crucified him. Satan is not all that smart. He knows your flesh. He knows your habits because he helped make some of those. But you're not going to walk in the flesh. We're not going to know any man after the flesh. We're going to walk best we can with God after the spirit where Satan cannot touch us. Satan can't get into the spirit realm, folks. He's been locked out. You can at any moment walk right into the spirit and fellowship with God. And he can't. So what does he do? He gets you so caught up in life, so caught up in the negatives of your life that you don't feel like praying, don't feel like doing anything. Come on now, we've been there, haven't we? So let's go rescue other people and tell them the good news. We're not selling religion here. We're giving a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we can get out of here. <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. Amen. So listen, we can be hearers of the word, but not doers. Do you believe that? I call it mental agreement, mental assent. It's an, it's an English word which means you agree with something, but you're not going to do anything about it. There are plenty of people who say, oh yeah, the word of God is the word of God, and I, be I believe in Jesus. But their actions don't say anything about that. They're still sinning, still drinking, still partying, everything's going on. You can't tell that they've made peace with God. Hello? Are you with me? And so we need to realize that there should be a change when we have peace with God. Say amen. amen. We should be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. We shouldn't just agree. James, half-brother of Jesus, said this. He says, the devils believe in God. They're just scared of him. We believe in God, don't we? Yes. But our job is to do what God says. It's really easy. Why do you say that, Pastor? When God asks you to do something, does he let you do it by yourself? No. That's right. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. So if he asks you to do something that seems pretty wild, he's going to be right there with you to do it. Hello. We forget. We're not doing it for God. We're allowing God to do it for himself. We come along for the ride. We follow our shepherd we don't wander around like a bunch of goats. Look at somebody and go, meh. <laughs> 
Sheep follow goats, but, but this, but that. Oh yeah, but, you never know, but, but, but. I used to go on for a while, my dad said, leave the butts alone, man. <laughs> you know, you can laugh with me a little, okay? Because that's how the human person thinks. If I could just pray harder, if I could just get in the word and get some understanding like, like Peggy does, then I know I'll be all right. You see the fallacy and the deception in that? Do you actually see that? You're not supposed to be comparing yourself with anybody else. You're the only one like you in the world. So be the best you can be with Jesus' help. Say amen. All right, we're going to cover these four things. Everyone say four things. So our subtitle is Becoming a Doer of the Word. I know it's a simple title, but really the areas that we do not succeed in are the areas we do not do the word in. Look at somebody and say, huh. All right. We're going to cover these four areas. Number one, we got saved by doing the word. The second thing we'll cover is the two sons, the religious one, the one in the flesh, and the desirous to obey one. Two sons, we're going to cover that. Three, we're going to cover what it's like to be wise or foolish. Now, I know if I interviewed every one of you, you certainly can tell me what it's like to be wise. And you can certainly tell me what it's like without going into detail. Our life in the past, where it was foolish, right? Let me tell you something about your past. The devil's there. Your mistakes are there. So kill them and only remember the good things about your past. Say amen. Your present, the devil's there in your present. The temptation's here in our present. So we have to meet with God so he, he covers and shields us. So we're not har being harassed by him all day long. Now some people really get harassed by the enemy. That's because they're dwelling in their head. Satan dwells in the reasoning faculties. He can't get to your spirit man. Your reasoning. So he moves you from the spirit man into your logic and into your, your understanding of things. And he tries to get us to pull some of the things we experience from the past aha, <coughs> excuse me, to the present to try to repeat the same dumb thing that didn't work before. That's us trying to analyze our walk. No, you go to God say, I need your wisdom. I need your understanding. And Lord, I need you to lay out my path. So when I get up today, it's going to be about you and I'm going to follow you. You'll find out your whole day will come right together because you are allowing him to guide your steps. Say amen. Well, I don't know. I don't know if God can really do that. Well, he won't with you because you don't know. You got to believe. You got to believe and trust what God says. Say amen. Third thing is, we can be wise or foolish. And then the fourth thing, if we do these things, what are the results? If we do these things, let me go over again. We got saved by doing the word. Two, we're going to look at the two sons. One did the word, one did not. Three, we're going to look at the wise and the foolish, just as examples. Remember, don't wear this shoe if it don't fit. <laughs> and if we, if we do these things, what's going to happen? So open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 10, please. You're going to look 8 through 11. Okay. Now, while you are going there, I'm going to read Luke chapter six or excuse me yeah luke chapter five four through seven now just listen to me you should be romans chapter 10 8 through 11 now just listen to what i read you it says when he had stopped preaching he said to simon simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets now listen to what simon says and simon answered and said to him master we have toiled all night and caught nothing nevertheless at your word. You see, it's the doer of the word that's blessed, not the hearer only. 
He could have said, no, not tonight. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow for you, Jesus. He says, nevertheless, at your word. See the key? We do things, nevertheless, at his word. And you say, well, I don't know the, his word for my life. First of all, when you pray, God develops his voice in you so you can hear it. He doesn't talk in your head. He talks in your core. Someday ask God when you're all by yourself. Say, Lord, do you love me? Then listen into the core of your being. You'll hear, I love you. Or you might hear more than you know. Right down in here, you'll thought, whoa, that was God. See, but whenever we slow down and ask the time to have him talk with us. That's how we develop in the spirit. Say, oh, me. All right, so listen to what it says. It says, Simon says, nevertheless, at your word, I will let it down. What happened? And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. So they signaled to the other partners of the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. See what happens when we obey God's word. Now that's my opening scripture for you. Now you're in Romans 8. So how did our life change, Pastor Kerry? Well, we, somebody shared with us about the Lord. And maybe we didn't accept it at that time. And then somebody came by and shared again. If you're like me, the first time it was shared, I just wrote them off as being nuts. Second time they shared, I cussed at them and told them to get off my family's porch. Third time it stuck. You know what got me saved? My cousin led me to the Lord. When you lead somebody to the Lord, they have to pray after you. You have to give them something to say. Don't, don't take chances that they're going to think their way to heaven. Just say, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. Come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. You, you cover those areas because you're surrendering your life and your sin to him. So he can cleanse it and come into you. Remember, the will of God in our prayers, check this out, is like, how many's ever worked with clay? Maybe a big slab of clay and you're trying to make some kind of a bust or something out of clay. And you're shoving it with your thumb and everything. And you're making indentations and, you know, trying to get that clay to work. Now listen, your prayers are like your thumbs in clay. You're molding and you're moving the clay so the Spirit of God can flow into those areas. For example, if I use Sherry. Lord, I pray for Sherry today. I bless her and her family. I'm asking you to go in and touch her heart. Areas that she still feels broken in. Go right in there, Lord, and just heal her up. You see, I'm moving the clay so the Spirit follows the words of my mouth in Jesus' name. Do you see it? Okay. Prayer is that way. Prayer is giving God invitation. We have not because we. So you have to ask God to give him invitation. You got a brother that's not saved? Say, God, I'm asking you to go in and get him saved. Unlodge his false trusts. And go in and describe it. Take some time in, with God. You're not in a hurry. And describe what you want done. Hello. In Jesus' name. That's your prayer life. You're a master at praying. Say amen. You might not be good at painting. You might not be good at really working clay, but you're pretty good at talking. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> amen. I knew people that could cuss flypaper off the wall. You know, you get them turned around and loving Jesus and they could pray down revival. <laughs> We can all laugh at that. All right. So you got this? Romans chapter 10, 8 through 11. Now listen, it's because we act on the word that we get saved. Listen to what it says. But what does it say? This is talking about the word. The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. 
So you acted on the word. You heard the word. Somebody came by and said, you really need to be saved. Oh, you re okay, what do I do? Pray after me. So you begin to act on the word. You prayed from your heart, asked with your mouth, and you became saved. So you were a doer of the word right there, and it created change. So doing the word creates change. So you want to do some of the word every day so it keeps continually changing you. Can you say amen? You can't religiously say, well, I got a handle on it. Like, for example, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I was sitting in a, in a church service one time, didn't know much, but I knew that wasn't right. I'm sitting in the church and this guy gets up and I want to thank God that God took my wife, took my children, took my land. And because of that, I found him. I found him as my Lord and Savior. What a testimony. Now you blame God for all your own mistakes. That's not his testimony. I'm glad he saved me. All the rest I did. <laughs> Moving right along. So you believed in your heart, confessed with your mouth, you acted on the word, and you became saved. Right on. For example, someone preached, shared with you the message of salvation. Faith came by hearing a little. Watering came, and suddenly you prayed your prayer and acted on the word, and you became saved. Two, we heard the word, we acted on it, and we became saved. Now, salvation is one of those words. Everyone say one of those words. That follows me everywhere I go. So what do you mean by that? In our tenses or in our past, present, and future tenses. How many know you have a past, you have a present, and a future, right? Well, in the Greek, you have a past, present, future, and continual. In other words, you're saved, but salvation is working with you right up to the present moment. You have Jesus in your heart, and he's working with you right up to the present moment. He has never left you nor forsaken you. So the package is working on you. The key is we got to get ourselves before the Lord every day so he can shut down our flesh, which resists him, so we can grow up out of ourselves. And we have to become doers of the word of God and not hearers only. Say amen. Thirdly, now just think. We have Almighty God dwelling in us. We have his name. We have his armor. We have his blood. We have his word. We have his angels. We have his kingdom. We have his covenant. What in the world has the devil got? Evidently, he might have something on you. And everyone say, not me. Because you go to God and you ask God to cleanse you every day. You're not getting born again, again, again. You're just going and getting cleansed again. Amen. When I go out and work in my garden, I went and pulled up all the stuff. I had some good crops this year, um, uh, some peppers and all like that. But my hands are all gritty and, and dirt. What do I go do? Amen. You get gritty and dirty throughout the day, so you meet with God and get, he cleanses you. Don't you wash your hands after your greediness before you eat your soup? <laughs> yeah. Don't wash your hands before dinner? Boy, you should have been in my house. That was a swat. You know? <laughs> you know you clean up, you know? Amen. When you get up in the morning, you're sleepy and your hair's all matted. And, you know, you drool all over the side of your lip. You get up, wash your face. You, know, you see the same idea, but spiritually talking. You're not religious. You have a spiritual relationship that if you operate in it properly, Satan, you'll drive Satan right out of your life and your family's life. And anything you put your hand to, if you've got a business or you have something that you've invested in. Are you with me? Do you believe God is short-sighted? Do you believe like some of the other? I used to believe this. I believe God covered me and saved me, Sherry. But there was still part of me that wasn't saved. So I walk around wondering what God or what the devil was going to do to me next. That is not the way God wants us to walk. You get up in God. Hello? Having done all to stand? Stand. What are you standing? You stand in God. If any man be in Christ, if you be risen with Christ, 
Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden in Christ, in God. So when you get up from prayer, Satan doesn't even know where he went. Because he doesn't see you. He sees God getting up. And he goes, God, don't send him my way. I don't want God on Peggy coming my way. Satan doesn't like the Christian who knows how to wear God's clothes. Satan can't stand a Christian who knows how to get dressed in God. I changed the word throne room to God's dressing room. That's where we address God and he dresses us. Can you say amen? All right, let's go on. So we got saved by acting on the word of God. Say amen. Let's go to our second point. The two sons. The lesson here Jesus is teaching is those that say they're going to do something and do it or not. And those that say they don't want to do it but end up doing it. Check this out. Matthew 21 verse 28 through 31. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to his first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said to him, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Verse 30, Then he came to the second and said likewise. And he said to him, I go, sir. And, and then he did not go. Listen to the next phrase. Which of the two did the will of his father. And what did he do? He acted on what the father asked him to do. He regretted it. First, didn't want to do it first, but then he did it. What have I always told you about maturity? Christian maturity is when you do the right thing, even if you don't feel like it. Even if we don't feel like it. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. Feelings have very little to do with things. Hello? Are your feelings going to get you to heaven? Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Scott, remember this. I've sang this forever. <laughs> feelings controlling you. Fe no, I won't do any of that. I just like to ham it up a little bit. Get you to laugh. Are you with me? So, look at And the other one says, I will not. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the two sons represent two entities represents our flesh and our spirit as one. How many know your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak? Jesus said that to his disciples in the garden. Remember, he said, pray with me. So, so your spirit is willing. Pray that you enter not to temptation. Spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. That's why we take our flesh every morning and crucify before God. Our flesh is always weak. It's always going to do the weak thing. It's always going to try to do the wrong thing. Always giving the excuse. One beer is not enough. You've got to have ten. You know, it just keeps, never stops. So you've got to crucify the flesh. Why do we crucify the flesh? Because Satan's very nature is in our flesh. Adam saw to that. Got right into our DNA in our blood. Now, folks, this is the gospel I'm teaching you, but not in the gospel religious way. When they ate of the fruit, it had something in it that poisoned their skin, flesh, and blood. Didn't touch their spirit nor their soul, but separated it. Thank God, because it would have touched their spirit and soul. There would be no salvation for us. We would have become a Nephilim. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do, is to change the human race into his creation. Grab the planet back and move on. That's the whole history of the gospel. It started off first when Satan declared war against God. Then God answered him back in Genesis 3.15. It said it would be the seed of the woman that will crush your head, dude. Carrie paraphrased. So the whole thing is a seed war. Good versus evil. But you and I stepped out. We stepped into Christ. We've already won because Jesus said it is finished. So the deception for a Christian is to think they always have to get victory. Always have to get the victory. That's a deception. When you said, Jesus, come into my heart, you already got the victory. He lives right here. Now stop trying to live for him. Start obeying him. Say amen, somebody. That's the key. 
You can't live for him without God's help. You cannot. I tried. Paul says, oh, wretched man, I, I, I want to do good, but I can't do it. Surrender, let God take over in you. Very important. Say, Lord, I don't know how to do that. Ask him to teach you. Just start off like you're brand new every day. Ask God to teach you. He will not leave you disappointed. Say amen. So the two sons, one said, I'm going to do it. Does it not? The other entities this represents, it just represents the Jews and the Gentiles. God always goes to the Jew first because they brought forth a Messiah. So he appeals to them first because it's polite and it's right. But if they rejected them, he went to the Gentiles. Hello? Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. He left the house, went into the, went by the sea. Okay, so the thing you need to realize, God doesn't know any difference now. There's neither Jew, Gentile, male, nor free, bond, nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus if we've accepted him. So look at your neighbor and say, I'm not better than you. And you're not better than me. But together, we're better than him. You know, we're going to pound the devil's head in. Can you say amen? You see, all in through the Old Testament, there's so many types and shadows. How many here remember it says, as the days of Noah, so shall be the days of the son of coming man. Let me make it simple. Noah built that ark for 120 years. It took him 120 years for him and his family to build the ark. Who was watching him build it all that time? Everybody. And he would appeal to him every day, come, come, get on the ark. God's got salvation for you. Come, come, get on the ark. God's got salvation. And they all laugh and mock him. God does not like Christians to mock anything. Don't be a mocker. God doesn't even want you railing on the devil. Let him rail on the devil by releasing him. You see, we fight the devil by releasing God on him like salt on a slug. If you don't know how to do that, come to one of my classes. Well, when are you going to have one? When I can get you to be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm doing that for the men on a Friday night. And men, one of these days will figure it out that I have some real great things I want to share with them. Amen. So I'm just throwing that out at you. Amen. Maybe sleep is more important to you at that moment. It's okay. All right. So let's go back to what we're doing. The two guys, one obeyed, one did not. Let's go to the third thing. The difference between a wise person and a foolish person. You know the scripture very well, but listen to how it speaks to your heart. Go with me to Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 46. And while you're going there, I want to read this scripture to you. These people draw near to me with their mouth. And they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus talked about the Pharisees. How many know, but he who does the will of God shall abide for, I got the hiccups, forever, right? Who are you? Are you a doer of the word? How long are you going to abide? Forever. He that doeth the will of God, the word of God shall abide for. Look at your neighbor and say, that's me. I'm abiding forever. Your life is never going to stop. You're going to exist forever. Boy, you better prepare yourself. <laughs> Amen. We're going to go here soon. Somebody said one time, Pastor Kerry, how soon do you think we're going to go? Could be tomorrow. It's that quick. We don't know. I don't know. But I live like he could come at any moment, but I plan like he'll never come. Which means visions, doing things, getting things done is good. And then if he comes and interrupts me, wonderful. So I live unto God holy, ready for his coming. But he might not come right away. So at least I am and you are ready. Can you say amen? All right, Luke 6, 46, it says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do, not do the things that I say. We have to be a doer of the word. Whoever comes to me, didn't Jesus say, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Don't learn about me. 
learn from me. There's a spirit to spirit. Amen. And you'll find rest to your souls. All right. So it says, and he that heareth my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a what? He is like a man building a house who dug deep. There's the key. You have to dig into the word. You have to dig deep into, your, into Christ. Dig deep and lay the foundation on the rock. Who's the rock? Who's the rock? Now, what you need to know is a rock in the Old Testament. It says the rock that followed them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you want to write the description, you can read about it. It says how that they went through the water and passed through the sea and then were under a cloud and they do baptize in the rock that followed them, followed them. You see, in the Old Testament, the Lord had to guide and, and project aggressively with the Israelites because what did the Israelites keep doing? doubting and doing crazy things so God had to literally follow them and guide them firmly and strictly but we're not in the Old Testament the rock isn't following us the rock is in us and we're standing on the rock so we don't the rock doesn't follow us the rock's under our feet and in our heart so everywhere we go we're on the rock amen you have to get that in your thinking. Joshua, God said to Joshua, everywhere you go, Joshua, to claim it, it's yours. The earth and the fullness thereof belongs to the Lord. The Lord gave it to Jesus. He gave it to us. And he says, are you going to sit there and do nothing? Or let's go ahead and let's get started together as a partnership and let's take over. You and God are a partnership. All God and 1% you. Obeying. Say amen. amen. So he says, but the one that heareth my sayings and does not do them, he is like unto a foolish man which dug and laid his foundation on sand. Now, what does the Bible say we're made of? Clay or sand. Okay. So building your life on what you want, how you see things, how you want things to do is not always the best thing because it's sifting sand. It changes. Hello. How many here remember when you were a kid, you didn't like certain foods, but when you got older, certain food, you just eat them now because there's no big deal. You like them now. Things change when you, when you grow. You don't hold into a lock step. You, things change when you grow. And so God's developing and helping us to do that. But we have to build on the rock that doesn't change, not on how we think the rock wants us to live. You see, you cannot interpret God what he wants for us. We go to God and just listen and have him lay it out for us. Then we simply, as a child, a sheep, it says. But sheep have no brains. Don't throw nothing. In other words, they're obedient animals that know the voice of their shepherd. They know the kindness of their shepherd. And they follow him because the shepherd gives them good food, gives them good pasture, clear water, leads them out of trouble. Huh? Hi, sheep. Now stop being a goat. Relax a little bit. And get used to his voice. Get used to how God guides you in his gentleness and his power. Firm and confident. Not like some crashy wave or some cloud without water. Firm like an ocean. Has volume and strength. Say, that's who lives in me. That's who lives in you. And tell him, Lord, I love you living in me. Please don't go. I'm just kidding. All right. And so the foolish man builds on his own opinion, builds on the opinion of mankind. Remember what God told us five, six years ago. Eyes off the world system. Eyes off other people looking to them for answers. And eyes off yourself. You want to get depressed? Think about me all the time. Not me, me, but you, you. I'm my own best friend. You think about it because people who, now I'm not picking on you. I want you to get this. People that never physically died off to the Lord get offended quickly. 
Somebody will say something, they'll take it wrong because your flesh can't separate things properly. It's full of pride, nastiness. Sure it is. Don't look at me and see, you're a lady. I know what I like when you can get angry, rip somebody a new one. Hello? Let's be honest. So we want to get out of that realm. So we can't focus on ourselves. Who do we focus on? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the people's rejection, the shame, and has sat down at the Father's right hand for you and I. He's looking at Bo Sherry sitting, and he's praying for him. Lord, bless him. Help him, Lord God, to realize that what they've experienced is not me, most of it. So, Lord, I have good... And so, when we start praying for each other, boy, folks, when we start praying every day for each other in the church here, you're going to see things popping and moving like you've never saw before. But, oh, the enemy will have you just praying for yourself. Oh, Lord, if you get me through this one. You're following the Lord, aren't you? Yeah. Well, he'll get you through it. Just hold on. Okay, let's move on. A couple of points. Our Father wants us to do the word so that we're on the rock. Say amen. amen. Hearing, point two, hearing and doing creates depth and development in Christ. It creates a wise man who considers God and centers their life upon Jesus Christ. Thirdly, he is our rock, which the builders rejected. The Bible says in Peter that he is the rock in which the builders rejected. He's a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense that those that stumble, now listen, those that stumble at his word. You see, mentally, you're not going to figure the word out. And I, I, I spoke to Joanna. Joanna, I appreciate this. That she says, I'm not getting much out of the word. I said, Joanna... Apply your heart, not your head. When we try to go to the church and apply our head and try to figure things out, you're going to miss everything. Open your heart like some little kid and say, Daddy, feed me. Show me. And he has, he just knows. He, he, he created you. He's the only one that knows how to go right on into your little tinkerings and go in there and make those beautiful adjustments. Everything God does for you is good. Why? Because you once were a child, purposed and planned, but Satan stole us away from his fa our father in Adam. Now Jesus came to rescue us back. Now we should develop a relationship with him. Say amen. So the difference between wise and foolish is he that does the word or he that just hears the word and does it nothing. Let me ask you something. Here's an example. God says when you pray, didn't say if you pray, when you pray. So if you're not praying, you're disobedient to God and you're open fetter for the enemy to shoot darts in you. You got to do certain things. How many know you have to get dressed to go out into society or you'll get something you won't, <laughs> you'll scare the snot out of somebody. Can you say amen? There's certain things that we have to do and obey that are just right and so I want you to get this so in, in doing that so becoming a doer of the word is what we need to do now who's the word Jesus is the word right so if we do the word we're doing Jesus maybe you haven't saw it that way God told me a long time ago let me see if I can say it right he says son if you study who you are in my word and you find out what I'm doing in your life. What you do then is me doing it through you. You'll become what I'm doing in the earth. If you surrender, let me take over your life. I will guide your steps. I will prosper you. I will cause you to be healthy. But at the same time, I will be doing it, not you. So it will always be a success. Has God ever had a failure? Well, let him run your life then. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. All the failures came from you. So what do I do, Pastor? Don't freak out and say, oh, I'm a rotten person. That's what the devil wants you to say. No, just say, Lord, you got to help me. 
Somehow I missed class 101, how to die to myself and live for God. I got all the other religious parts, but I, I missed the one dying to myself. Most important, if you desire to follow Jesus, you have to first deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow him. For he that seeks to save your own life, to make yourself somebody, you're going to lose it. But if you seek to make him somebody, God will give you life and promote you and your talents. How I many know when you do it right, God's way, he prospers it. You got a business? Do it the way God asked you to. Meet with him, ask, consult with him. Watch your business flourish. But if you start cutting corners, you start going back into old habits, the devil going to pick you off again, and he'll make it worse this time. So don't slip on back. Move on forward. You got a question? Come see me or my wife. We'll help you. If you don't know how to run a business, I'll show you how to run a business. First, you put God in charge. First key, first step. God's in charge. That means you consult him for every change in business decision. How about your family? How many know that's even more important than business? Well, we should be doing that with our family. Have you got children that are not quite serving the Lord like you want them to? Get that clay out and start praying. Amen. Lord, I want a Pinocchio nose on my son. <laughs> Moving around a lot. Got hardly any laps with that. So, how many know? We're wise and not foolish. All right, go with me to James chapter 1. Almost done with you. James chapter 1, look at verse 22 through 25. Very familiar scripture, but listen to what it says. It says in verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Have we established that with you? If God says pray, what are you going to do? If God says forgive, what are you going to do? If God says to give, what are you going to do? You do it to obey God because God always has a blessing in your obedience towards him. Right? He doesn't bless a nothing. If you don't put nothing out, nothing comes in. Oh, I'm putting plenty out. Really? And that's where you're dressed in poppers? And those are the poppers PJ makes. <laughs> I'm just joking. Amen. So are you still with me? Say I'm wise. It says, amen. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. So when you start thinking what you can do for God, you're already deceived. If you start easily getting distracted, finding that your prayer life is waning, you're not in the word like you should, you're already becoming deceived. Too much of your flesh has now raised itself up. You need to take it and crucify it. Say Amen. And what really you do is say, Lord, I ask you to crucify my flesh in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord God, to lay it out so it does not hinder you. You see how I did that? That's how you do that. Just imagine yourself just throwing it on down. Otherwise, it will never be happy. And you'll, it will run you into a scenario that you'll think that if you miss anything, everything is going to fall apart. You're deceived. Don't you believe God has got your life together? Just simply obey him and get your joy back and serve the Lord. Say amen. 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 Serve the Lord. You have something important to do for God. You can't get you on your mind. It will literally mess everything up. Get you off your mind. All right. It says... For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing what? His natural face. What's he looking at? He's looking at his own abilities. You see, we're not any more like we used to be. We are a new creature in Christ. So when you look in the mirror, do you see what Christ is doing in your life? Or do you see the natural man? I got up this morning, Sherry, and I looked in the mirror, and I said, who is that? <laughs> Early all summers. <laughs> Amen. So we are always used to ourselves. 
God wants us to look into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and continue therein, will become then a, not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. So we have to continue in the word, continue to look at what the word is saying to us. Can you say amen? The word says you're more than a conqueror. The word says you're blessed. The word says you were a sinner, now you're a child of God. Start taking the word and its reflection back to what God has said to you and not what you see in your natural man. Say amen. And it says, because for the man observes himself and goes away immediately, forgets what kind of man he was. You are a spiritual person. Stop focusing on yourself. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's your Bible, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Blessed in what he does. Now, I didn't get him in, 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 in time, but when you leave, you'll notice the cute little co um, pumpkins that I got out there. Amen. Amen. I, I put my faith out and I says, Lord, God, get us a pumpkin. You know, get us some pumpkins. And he provided. So it was really great. You know, but sometimes we can't see it till actually it shows up. Can you say amen? All right. The last point. Everyone say, if I do these things, I will never fail. Did you know the Bible says that? Let's see what he's talking about. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 5 through 9. But it says, but also for this very reason, now that we've discussed all this, imagine now Peter is talking to you and I. We've heard all this so far preached. But also for this very reason, because of this preaching, give all diligence. Get after it. Go after it. A diligent person is somebody just really motivated and goes for it. Add to your faith virtue. Virtue means an outward excellence. Okay? It means you walk around stately and excellent. You have virtue. You don't run around and say, I want to show you what my faith can believe for. You don't act goofy or gungy. It says, add to your faith in God a virtuousness. Say amen. All right. So purpose in your heart that God make you virtuous and carry him about stately and with excellence. Say amen. And add to your virtue what? knowledge. I remember when I first got saved, I, I knew very little about a lot of things. <laughs> then after a while, I, I knew a whole lot about a lot of things. Then as I grew up, I found out that I don't have to talk a lot because when you talk a lot and you don't know a whole lot, everybody knows you don't know a whole lot. But if you talk very little and don't know a whole lot, they'll think you're wise. Too. Once you do know, talk what you know that God has revealed to you. Don't talk your opinion. Well, let me just tell you this. You'll never get me to preach issues. Issues divide us. Preach the gospel, the Bible says. That's why you don't hear me saying, you know, I hate abortion. What do you think? See, now it becomes, what about there's somebody who might have had one? Didn't know any better. Now they're saved. You see, so we, I don't preach issue. I preach the word. It isn't about issues. They change. Hello? It's about our walk with God. Say amen. And that's where it's at. So don't preach issues. There's plenty of them to preach on. Okay, so we don't want to do that. But it says, listen. So add to your, knowledge, uh, your virtue knowledge and knowledge, self-control. Everyone say self-control. Self-control means control yourself. Self-control also means you don't have to say what you feel like saying at this moment. Self-control regulates you so that you have a prayer life. It works positively as well as negatively. Amen. It, because God is our self-controller. Can you say amen? And if he's in charge, he'll tell you how to eat. I lost. I have a picture of the way I looked. I looked huge. 
325 pounds. And God says, I want you to lose the weight. And I went, ah! He says, I'll work with you. And so he just showed me what to do, and I did it. And I'm still losing. But I'm healthy. I'm doing good. I mean, after all I've been through, it's the work of the Lord. He's the one that pulls us through things. Don't give up. Don't throw up your hands and say, I don't know why this isn't happening. No, it's happening. Maybe you just haven't figured it out yet. So it goes on further. It says, and add to your knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance. In other words, endurance. Don't give up easily. Keep on going. And into your endurance, godliness. And to your godliness, brotherly kindness. How many know we're to be kind to one another and not rude? I'll just leave it at that. And brotherly kindness, we add love. For if these, now this is what this is what I'm getting to. These things are yours. Everyone say they're mine. Who lives in your heart? So they're in you. Now they have to come out of you though. These things are in you and abound. You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Barren nor unfruitful. Wow. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You're a child of the living king. You make mistakes. You see, I don't throw my son out because he banged my car. No, he's just out of fellowship. <laughs> Until we make it right. See, when you make mistakes, God don't throw you away. You don't stop becoming a child of God. He's, you're his child. And he deals with you with loving, hoping that you see the error of your ways and turn around. He doesn't deal with this Old Testament harshness. And you know why? Because God lives in us. Why would he beat himself? Jeez, are we that dumb? People out there are preaching, well, God's leading you through the mud and going through the crud, and he's going to one day reveal what his will is for you. Are you stupid? That isn't God. God lives in me, and he is like a control guidance system. How do the birds know to fly back to their home nest? How do the bird fish know where to fly? swim up the street the same way that you know that God is the right answer and if you develop a relationship with him you're going to have that too can you say amen the idea is the distractor wants to get you off course almost done man it's foggy up here you guys sense the presence of God in here it's been getting I've been cleaning the church which is fine doing some things and I pray in the spirit and set everything up and it's been getting cloudier and cloudier for the last three or four weeks and it's just like God's waiting here for us to show up and do things but you got to expect you got to open up to those things can you say amen all right let's finish up with you and it says and you add to your goodness brotherly kindness brotherly kindness love for these things be in you you neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ if you've forgotten these things, you're short-sighted, clumsy. Okay, so let's look at a couple of points. We are to give all diligence to add to our life these qualities that are in our heart, allowing them to come forth in the way we treat people. Say amen. Two, these are God's inspired qualities, not something that you do or act. These are God's nature qualities coming out of you. Let them come out. God's qualities and character are in your spirit. So you've got to learn to let them out. Release them out. When I lay hands on the sick, it's not my hand that heals them. It's the God that flows through my hand. You see. It's God that comes down and flows through my hand and meets them where they hurt. Somebody just learned something new. That's okay. We got lots of stuff to teach you. I just don't have you enough. You have a schedule. You have a life. You live. I can't get you to all these things. But if you have an idea, you want to learn stuff, you come and let us know what you want, okay? Because I'm sitting on all this information, you know, and I want to get it out to some of you because you're hungry for it. Say, oh, me. So these qualities are progressive. 
To have brotherly kindness, the more you meet with God, the more you have brotherly kindness, it grows. Okay, so let me show you. Say, I'm a, I'm a human. I'm a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. Look at your neighbor. Say, you are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. Now, fo now folks, your body is not the real you. You bathe it, you feed it, you wash it, and you keep it in check. Your soul, on the other hand, came from God. So when God downloaded your spirit and soul into the womb of your mother, it came down perfect from heaven. So it's like your computer program. When you bought your new laptop or computer, it came with certain programs. Your personality, your will, your emotions, your appetite, your intellect. Hello? That's your, who you are. How many know my personality is different from yours? All right. Now, here's the crux. Who do we have living in us? Okay. Who needs to inspire our soul? So, have you ever seen somebody with a personality like Don Knotts? Who agitates people for a living? I don't know if he's gone now or not. But, uh, okay. So, but anyway, I liked him. You know, I figured, hey, if you're a wimp, sit under his meeting a couple of times, figure out, you know, straighten it all out. <laughs> Our personalities, your mind. How many know your mind needs help? So the reason is to bring God up into your mind to help your thinking, to be spiritually minded. Then the next is your will. This is your soul I'm talking about. How many know your will needs to be influenced properly? Okay, it needs to be influenced by God and not by your peers or by those people around you in your job. You either do this, you're fired, you know, this kind of thing. So our, our will has to be massaged by the God who lives in us. Can you say amen? Then our emotions. How many know some people can be way out there with emotions? But see, if our, we have the God who keeps us self-checked, our emotions will be in check. You see, I weep over the sins of people. I weep over my relationship with God. But I don't weep out of sorrow or guilt. That's all been removed from me. You see, even when you make a mistake, somebody needs to hear this. God doesn't give you guilt. He says, now let's deal with that and let's get, let's overcome that. But he never puts guilt on you. That's the devil that does that. And that's your unrenewed mind that makes you feel guilty all the time. God says, he removed it. You're his child. Hello? But my hand was in the cookie jar. I, you already look guilty. Let's remove that from you. Huh? God's not going to stand you in the corner, David. Put hands in the cookie jar. No, he's going to love us out of this. He realizes that we're living in a planet that's fallen with an outlaw in it that hates everything that's human. So we got to work with them. We got to get close to them. Stop playing the games you did for years. Thought that that was Christianity. It's not. What's Christianity is walking with God and seeing the supernatural things manifest before your eyes. Woo! Nothing like it. All right, and finishing, 2 Peter chapter 1, again, verse 10 and 11. This is our finishing scripture. All right. If you do these things, you will never stumble. All right. So, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. There's that word again. Get after it to make your call and election sure. First, uh, Ephesians chapter uh, verse 4, verse 1 through 3. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Make your election and calling sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Huh? Huh? In other words, if we check ourselves in with God like we're supposed to do, do those things that are right, you'll have plenty of non-stumbling days to enjoy your wife, your friends, the things you like to do. 
But when our life is not following after what we're supposed to do, then we'll piecemeal things together and we'll always be playing, listen, the catch up. Got to pay Peter to get Paul. We got to catch up. No, you do it God's way. He'll keep you ahead where the, everyone else will be catching up. Look to Israel for an idea. Israel has no red tape in developing medicines and things to help humanity. Now flip over to America. All we have is red tape. You want to get an invention to help somebody out? Good luck. You see what we're up against? Come against that system that blankets and hinders. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So don't rail on the president, even though he might not be, you think, or whatever, because that opened the door for the devil to rail on you. Instead, say, Lord, put the right people in the right places, cover yourself right, and let God do the punching. The Bible says when we're dealing with the enemy, having done all to stand, what? Stand. stand. He didn't say punch, rebuke, kick. He says, having done all to stand. If you read it, then it says, take the whole armor of God. In other words, put God on the devil. We never learned it that way. I always learned I had to rebuke the devil. I had to take authority over my blah, 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 blah. No, I only need to do that once and submit to God and then release God. The God in me and the God in the air we breathe and it's all around us, omnipresent, all the omnipowerful is everywhere present. Learn to be covenanted with him and release him. Stop making threats. Release power. Got it? For if we do these things, we will never stumble. For so an entrance will be ministered to us into the everlasting kingdom of his dear Savior. When we become non-offensive, God gives us a, a tour of the supernatural. If you're not hung up in your own thing, you're able to be free enough to be guided into an area, then free yourself in the, in the name of the Lord. Free yourself up so that God can kind and guide you into places he wants to reveal for you. He wants to show you. Can you say amen? As long as you have breath, he's not finished with you yet. Amen. Smile at your neighbor and say, I thought so. Amen. amen. Did you get something out of it? We give the Lord praise. All right. <laughs> 